What happens when we create machines that are as or more intelligent than we are? What are the possible timelines, implications, and ways forward to ensure we create the most positive future for our world? In this series on responses to AGI, we look at how people and organizations around the world are responding to a future with much more capable AI systems, and how we can look to respond even more effectively to this drastically different future. This is The AGI Show, and I'm your host, Saroosh Paul. Today, I have with me Adam. Nice to have you here, Adam. Great to be on the show. Thank you. He is sitting with me here in sunny Berkeley, California. He is the CEO of FAR. So FAR is one of the most prominent not-for-profits focused on research towards AI safety and alignment. So essentially ensuring that our future with these advanced AI systems goes well and we can control them effectively. So Adam completed his PhD in artificial intelligence at UC Berkeley, advised by Stuart Russell. For people who don't know, Stuart uh, Russell literally wrote the book on uh, artificial intelligence. I've got his big textbook sitting on my coffee table at home, and it's a great book to look at, and it covers a lot of ground. And Adam himself did his PhD on trustworthy machine learning, so very relevant to what we're talking about. And he's dedicated his career to ensuring that these more advanced AI systems act according to human preferences, which is very important. Adam, who I've spoken to before and followed his work quite closely, is incredibly knowledgeable about the world of AI, ensuring it actually goes well. And he's worked on himself, or worked on it directly himself as a researcher and now leads a, a large and growing organization here in FAR, research organization. So the reason I asked him to come on the show today is because I'd like to hear more about FAR's work directly. I'd like to hear about the alignment ecosystem, and I'm sure our audience would love to learn more about that. And then finally, it'd be also good to talk about the gaps and opportunities for how we can be responding even better to both the challenges and the opportunities of advanced AI systems. So for all those reasons, I was really excited to have Adam here on the show. And um, yeah, it's great to have you here. Yeah, looking forward to it. I hope I can live up to that introduction. No, nah, totally can. I guarantee it. Awesome. So we'll start with just an easy one, Adam. Tell us a little bit just about yourself and what you're working on now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I made the decision to co-found FAR uh, towards the end of my PhD because I was looking at my own job opportunities and realized that most people are just going into one of two opportunities, either they pursue the academic route, so they try and become a professor, leave an academic lab, or they go work for one of the major AI companies that are working towards building AGI. So these are the likes of DeepMind, OpenAI, and Fropic. And there's lots of great work happening both in academia and in industry focused on safety. But I think there are some really large missing pieces. And what was dawning on me was that both of these options felt like I would be giving up some exciting directions that I had been pursuing in my PhD. So in the case of academia, there's a real limit to how big a project can be because it's got to be decomposed into these small paper-sized chunks that can be worked on by one or two graduate students typically because otherwise it's just you're taking a big career hit as a graduate student. Like I wouldn't have wanted to work on a project that had you know, five main contributors because it wouldn't be my paper. It wouldn't let me launch my career. So there's just a real limit to size of academic projects. Just, just on that, because yeah. I find that so interesting in having you know, interacted yeah. with a lot of research. You see these papers from places like OpenAI and Anthropic, where they almost put half the company yeah. on the... Uh, absolutely, yeah. So what's the... Is that a... What drives that difference? Is it a difference in incentives, engineering, something else? Yeah, I mean, I think the incentives is, is the main one where in, in industry, the company is being judged on its output as a whole. And there's just much more ability for that company to really encourage people to do things that are in the corporation's best interests. Mm. Whereas academia is much more of a sort of disorganized collection of researchers. And, you know, you have an advisor, you don't have a boss. And okay, in some cases, that's just a question of title and your advisor acts like a boss. But in most cases, and uh, you know, certainly in my case, it really that that title does live up to reality. Uh, you are in this more mentor-mentee relationship and you are receiving recommendations for what to do, but you can disregard those recommendations and go do something else on your own. 
And we even had seminars at the beginning of a PhD where we're basically, well, when should you ignore your advisor? <laughs> and you well, know, look, I'll not tell you all in the industry, time. you want to ignore yeah. your manager sometimes too. So that's sure, that sure, happen. yeah. So yeah, so just picking up that thread, that's one of the big differences uh, between academia and industry. But I think the, the flip side is the very structured nature of AI companies. It lets them work on these much bigger projects, but it also makes it a much less fertile ground for developing really novel ideas. And I see a lot of what I consider very talented researchers getting work for these companies. And in some ways, I'm just like a bit disappointed by what they do after oh. they join them, where like maybe they're executing really well on projects, but I'm thinking, oh, you're just working on this existing approach that sort of no one really thought was going to be enough to solve AI safety. It's just sort of making things a little bit better at the margin. So, so this made me think, okay, it feels like there should be something in the middle where you can work on projects that are bigger than a typical academic lab could do, but where there's a lot more autonomy and people are just encouraged to explore and pursue really high risk, but high reward research. So I was my, that was my vision for FAR. And I thought, okay, I'm going to, you know, start testing this out in my PhD. So I, was, I founded it then. And it, initially I was like, oh, if no one's going to want to work for this organization, I was, you know, at that point zero track record, I'm just a PhD <laughs> student, but I was actually sort of like really overwhelmed by the, the demand there were a lot of like very talented oh, wow. engineers okay, and junior right. researchers, so, you know, applying. And that's when you know um, you've tapped into something important. It, it, exactly. Yeah. So I thought, okay, you know, at least on the talent side, which is an area where I think a lot of startups live or die on, we're actually in a really good place because I think a lot of people are realizing AI safety is a really important problem and are also seeing the gaps that, that I was. So that that was really good news. And then I was also positively surprised on the, the funding side. I mean, that was a different time a couple of years ago. There was a lot more funding flowing around, but Again, I thought, okay, it's going to be hard to raise enough money to hire several people with very limited track record, but actually a number of people are quite interested in providing seed funding to the project. So I was able to, you know, fortunately kind of test it out during my PhD and it very quickly became apparent, okay, this is definitely something I want to do full time. And so I've tried to wrap up my PhD as quickly as possible. Was and so it, it was primarily me. I did have as another PhD student at UC Berkeley, Scott Emmons, who is working pretty closely with me. And I think I'd consider him a co-founder, although at this point he's moved on to found a different organization, which I you know, also really support him in doing. But yeah, he was really helpful in the in early stages, just helping drive forward some of the research directions. And then I also worked very closely with Ethan Perez, uh, oh, who had Montes. been... I didn't know Ethan was involved oh. in that early stage. Yeah, so, so Ethan had already been doing this more informal collaboration style organization where effectively he started this in his PhD where he just wanted to hire some extra people. And that in some ways is a similar model to what I was trying to push for where, okay, we want acad you know, something that's academic, but more ambitious. And of course, you know, Ethan went off to Anthropic. So he's a, the person so I'm criticizing point, going off to the company. Was he already at Anthropic or not yet? He, he was already at Anthropic at that point, yeah. So he was kind of winding down some of that while I was ramping up. But we did work together closely because there was some overlap there. But yeah, a lot of the early FAR projects were in collaboration with Ethan. So he helped out a lot on the, the research side. But in terms of more like the model and vision of FAR, that was primarily, primarily me. Yeah. Fantastic. But then uh, re fairly early on, Carl Bergens joined as our chief operations officer. And he's been really instrumental in turning this from a sort of disorganization into actually a fully functional organization. So, you know, in the early days, we're operating just as a fiscally sponsored entity. We're basically like a, a bit your existing nonprofit runs you as a project within their legal entity. So they handle all the accounting, taxes, compliance, and we very quickly outgrew that. Mm -hmm. So Carl was instrumental actually setting up our own legal entity, but more generally in terms of helping us establish team culture, strategic direction. So we're now actually doing a lot more besides research. We're also doing some field building events. We're sitting in a co-working space uh, set up. That I'm um, working in this week, so I'm very grateful for. Yeah, I'm glad, glad to hear it. was work from here. So that's supporting now five different organizations and 30 full-time members, and it's growing rapidly. And that is sort of, you know, 90% should be Carl and other people's credit, not mine. All I did was sort of, you know, walk through a few offices on estate agent tours and be like, oh yeah, this one seems <laughs> go, fine. Guys. I like this one. Yeah. It's got good ceiling space. <laughs> it, it is very high ceilings. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Awesome. Well, great summary. And it, it, it blows my mind also how young Clara is. Like it, I didn't, because I know, so Carl is also from Sydney where I'm from. So I knew him before he joined FAR and I remember when he was flying over and I think it was about a year or even less than a year ago. Yeah. It, and so I didn't realize the recency or something. And of course you've been working in the space since, you know, you started your PhD at the, you know, at the, you know, at, at least a, several years that way, but still it kind of just shows how nascent so much of this stuff is and also therefore how much we should be doing to kind of accelerate this high quality work towards things like alignment and other safety initiatives. Oh yeah, I think there's a huge amount of opportunities in this space and especially the last year or two, it's really gone from this idea that a lot of people are interested in, but it's maybe still a bit speculative towards just the most prominent individuals in AI research, like Jeffrey Hinton, Yoshio Bengio, who won the sort of Nobel Prize equivalent for deep learning, really saying, oh, we're very concerned about this technology. We think it could pose an extinction level risk. There's a number of other, you know, immediate dangers of this technology. We need more people working on this, these problems. And so, you know, now is just an excellent time to be starting to work on this because I think the whole field is beginning to pivot towards it. But that means there's a lot of people basically saying, well, okay, great. I, I believe this is a problem. But what do I do? Where do I actually slot in? And so I think we're, you know, both very excited to see what FAR can do to uh, grow and support the ecosystem. But I also would encourage listeners to think about, you know, where they might be able to slot in. Could you start an organization or could you co-found an organization or could you be an early employee at one of these organizations? Because I think that we're seeing a lot more opportunities than we have uh, the bandwidth to, to work on. And that, that's actually been one of the challenges is that there's so many things that we could be doing and we realize, no, we've got to just do, you know, two or three of them well, mm. but they are, that doesn't mean there's a lot of things that we're neglecting, which I think it would be, you know, well above the bar for, for someone to be working on. Absolutely. Fantastic. I couldn't agree more. It's why I've gotten involved and it's why many others are getting involved now. And hopefully in this episode and, and others, we can help our listeners better understand concretely what they can do to, to, to help out and possibly get full-time involved as well. Yeah. Fantastic. So I have, honestly, I have so many questions about the founding of FAR, but I'm going to hold that off. Sure. We, that could be the episode on how to start an effective not-for-profit. We'll hold that one and we'll, we'll talk more about alignment here today. Look, here's a question that I, I like to ask everyone just because you get really interesting, varied answers. So the question is simply, do you believe that we'll someday develop what people call AGI? And in this case, I'm defining that as a system that can solve most or all the problems that human beings can today. And if you do believe that, what do you think that future AGI might look like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a really cool question. I think it drives a lot of people's you know, differences in beliefs and, and behavior. My perspective would be that AGI is technically possible. I don't see any physical limits or prevent us from replicating what we can humans have in, you know, a carbon based computer effectively is what our brain is in a silicon computer instead. But of course that leaves open a wide range of possibilities of how, you know, technically tractable this is where things that are possible to do like it's possible to build a space elevator but we haven't done it yet because it would be very expensive and maybe not economically useful i think in the case of agi there's a really strong economic imperative if you look at you know what is for sort of the biggest cost of most companies it's okay it, it's people you know what is the main thing holding us back from curing cancer or solving other scientific problems it's really talented researchers to, to work on these problems so there is a really strong incentive for people to to build these systems and there's also a strong incentive to build systems that are not quite as capable as agi but moving in that direction like things that are more narrow artificial intelligence also very economically valuable so i think that you know by default i'd expect it to be developed but i don't think it's inevitable right there mm. are technologies that humanity could build and which might have some positives but which we choose not to because we think the risk is too great uh, so there's you know basically universally agreed upon moratorium on human germline modification. So you can't genetically modify a human because that's going to forever change human genetics if they then go on to the risks to are high. So we yeah. we're gonna do that. It's gonna be treaded incredibly carefully over the span right. of decades, not weeks and months. Right, right. So it's, it's, it's not something where, you know, one scientist is going to say, okay, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do this. And uh, you know the interesting thing is that 
is, there isn't even a particularly stringent regulatory structure around this. There actually mm. was a scientist in China that did this or claimed to do this, and he thought he was going to be hailed as a you know, scientific hero, and everyone well, was just he like, He did disappear what did off the do? map, so there might have been some sort it, of. Yeah, there, there may be some response, response afterwards, there. but there, there was nothing like stopping him from trying to do it. Sure. First you're place. right. It's, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't like some somebody was watching him every day. Cause... Right. Right. So, like, people are allowed to have access to the sort of technology that would be needed to, to do this. It's just that for the most part, scientists in that field really don't want to, to do this. Like, right. there's no it's incentives an ethical for ethical norm. And there are laws, but most people couldn't quote the laws. They can just quote yeah. the ethical norms. Yeah. So, so I, I'm not a techno determinist. I think that if humanity decides actually we don't want to build HUI, the risks are too great, or we'd like to pursue some other approach to, you know, more and more sophisticated technology, maybe that is just taking it slowly. Maybe that's human cognitive enhancement. Maybe that's something like whole brain emulation, where we have uh, like you know alternative something that is, pathways and yeah. technology tree. Yeah. So I think it's in our destiny to to choose that. But it's right now there are fairly strong incentives towards towards building it. And to touch on the sort of last part of a question of like, you know, what might it look like? And the related question there is how soon might it be? Sure. I think that I've got reasonably broad uncertainty here. I, I do think that the current approach in machine learning of basically train on larger and larger data sets with bigger and bigger models without any sort of significant algorithmic progress. It is plausible that would be enough for AGI. I mean, if you just interact with systems like GPT-4 or Claude 2, and many they are would argue very that, impressive. that these current systems have already achieved most yeah. of the definition anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, so certainly a lot of the benchmarks that you can come up with, including really hard ones like solving sort of college level exams, these systems do extremely well at. Yeah. In terms of things that are more like actual economic impact, it feels like there's a bit more of a, a lag there. Definitely. And some of that might just be, but we've not figured out the tooling for a way of using this technology. I deploy it into real world businesses, things yeah. like that. But, 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 you know, I have found it challenging even in my own workflows just to say, okay, I want this document to be edited. Okay, let's put it into Claude. And it, it doesn't do quite a good enough job, even though it would do much better than me on sort of trivia questions or, you know, passing the bar exam. Like I'm not a lawyer. I, I can't pass the bar exam. So just, it, just on this, because I've been thinking about a lot this this question. That I think one thing I, I've realized is a lot of these systems, they're as good as or better than the average human. Mm -hmm. But if you think about a job, we don't pick up the average human to do that job. We find right. the person who can do the job who's usually a specialist in that thing. So that's one of many blockers as to, well, yeah, you know, you could ask Claude to write something and it'd probably do a good job, but you want to do a great job and you know that you're specialized in that. So these kind of issues hold these things back. Yeah, I, I think that's a huge fact. I mean, it's a, the natural question is ask, okay, well, like how long is it going to take to to go past that stage? Because if you think of you, you have a human that's generally very good at a bunch of things. And, and we built a world yeah. around that system. Yeah. And yeah, it, it doesn't take that long, let's say, for someone to go from graduating high school, so that's always like reasonably good generalist, but they're not yet specialized in anything, to getting a college degree. So we just imagine the sort of AI progress followed that sort of similar developmental trajectory. It takes 18 years to get to, you know, to high school generalist. And it takes four years to get, you know, specialized in software engineering or, or law or something like that. And you might think, oh, actually, we're like most of the way there to AGI, which mm. might support like pretty short timelines. But then I think the, the thing that makes me have longer timelines, I think there might be more of a need for significant changes in how we train machine learning systems is that so far we're getting most of intelligence from training on these really large data sets. Mm. And that works great when you're trying to learn a task that just occurs all the time. Like you're summarizing documents or you're okay. writing grammatically correct text. This okay. is just present in every document. But if you're trying to learn something that's much more specialized, I need to form a long-term plan to pursue a scientific research project or a business plan. There's just far fewer case studies uh, like that that you Especially can Especially in terms of the entire sensory data set of that. Right. You know, there's case studies as in the 10 page Harvard Business Review article. Yeah. But the Harvard Business Review article is like a, not even a highlights reel. It's like the highlights reel of the highlights reel. You know, it's so limited in yeah. its actual data content. Yes. That these systems would learn off. Yeah, exactly. So I think if we actually did have, you know, every person recording all the interactions of a computer and a bunch of the rest of their life for 10 years and then we trained on that, like maybe that actually would be enough to get to AGI with not that much more than the techniques we currently have. But we don't have anything like that data set right now. So it seems like there's quite a big jump from able to perform these kinds of relatively short time duration tasks that are demonstrated, you know, all the time in this 
tax to be on Zoom is much longer horizon tasks where we just have far fewer data points. So I think that's one thing that would make me think that AI systems in the future might have more kind of explicit planning or other uh, elements that we think are important for condition baked into them, just because that seems like a, one of the ways of getting around this sort of data limitation and also makes me have sort of relatively long timelines. So I ex think my median for getting to a system like AGI, so sort of 50% likely it's sooner than this, 50% likely it's longer than this would be around 2045. Um, although I, I sort of, I think like my numbers fluctuate a bit from day to day. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And then sort of within the next 10 years, I'd probably put something like a, you know, anywhere between five and 10% chance on that. Yeah. But I do know people who seriously think, okay, five years to AGI, that's yeah. their sort of, that's their median. And I think if you don't think this sort of long horizon task is going to be a problem, then I think it's very easy to get to that because you just say, well, look how much more impressive these language models are getting Definitely. each generation. Yeah, yeah. I think your first point about uncertainties is key that the world even as a whole has a lot of uncertainties around this. And I think some of those uncertainties come from us not understanding, you know, what the challenges are going to be and the technologies. And then these others are also around the definitional problem of what is AGI. But yeah, I think everything you've said makes a lot of sense. And I think you've talked about some of the key challenges it's going to take to, to create this thing and whether we even want to do so at all. Interesting. Fantastic. Again, that's another one. Each of these questions could probably be a whole episode. So I'll always, I'll Absolutely. move us on for a little bit. Fantastic. The next question is, to the extent that you do see these, let's, I'll even avoid the word AGI for the moment. I'll say more advanced systems. These more advanced AI systems coming in the 2020s, 30s, 40s, 50s. What do you think are likely to be some of the implications mm -hmm. and, yeah, and therefore some of the challenges that we'll need to be thinking about? Yeah, this is a really key question that unfortunately I think a lot of AI developers maybe don't spend as much time thinking about this mm. as they should, but there's a sort of sense of, well, this is a cool technology and it's, you know, here in Silicon Valley, right? It's like tech, technology is a religion almost. It's, of course, technological <laughs> progress is good. Um, and, and arguably these days, not just Silicon Valley, but the yeah. world, you know, technology and economic growth have become the world's probably most dominant religion. Yeah. Given Christianity and Islam a run for their money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, for for, for good reason, sure, right? you know, not necessarily I'll, for bad reason. I, I would much rather be born, you know, in this generation than any previous generation with access to you know excellent medical care, sure. a huge amount of things we just take for granted in the society, only possible sort of technology. But uh, you know, there are some technologies that have just seemed pretty bad for a while, like nuclear weapons, and there's certainly like plenty of technologies that maybe we've managed to manage them such that on that they were positive, but they were you know. That was only because we were aware of the risks. So I think there's, you know, there's lots of potential risks from biosecurity as well, but that's just as a huge field focusing on that. Yep. But yeah, in terms of implications, I mean, I think there's a lot to be really excited about in this world. So, you know, as I was saying, mo the biggest bottleneck to solving many of the world's most important problems is sort of human cognitive labor. And so if we are able to augment that, or in some cases replace it with AI, that is just going to unlock a huge amount of, you know, very Absolutely. And we've already obviously seen this, you know, every single one of us is immensely more productive because of what computers and other technology has given us already. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely. I, I think you know, that, that point's an interesting one, and maybe a bit of a digression. We know Cal Newport would probably argue against some of us, right? And so, you know, email was just a sort of scourge of, of humanity and it's mm. prevented us from doing deep work. And so... On the one hand, yeah, technology can really help us be a lot more productive, but it's also it really depends like how we use that technology. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we all, there's an adjustment period, you know, like we all use email and other, you know, social media and other things differently than the day we first adopted them because mm -hmm. we realized, oh, this works except in these scenarios. And, and there's that adjustment period. And as technology has advanced more quickly, maybe that adjustment period has been shorter for us and, and harder to play that catch up with and i think that's something a lot of people feel in their lives yeah yeah no i, I think that's also a really important point but we just take some time for individuals and society to respond to new technology and find mm -hmm. the right way of engaging with it and you know we've seen this with every technology people are very afraid of a printing press and you know not without reason like clearly the printing process has been like very beneficial overall, but it did also make it you know much easier to spread misinformation. Like there, there were some like actual downsides to it as well. So I think it does just take sometimes, you know, a while for people to figure out how to integrate this. So, you know, one of my concerns with AI would be just the rate of change, right? But, it, you know, sort of existing, both 
institutions like governments, but also education, journalism, art and necessarily going to be able to like keep, keep up with the uh, pace of change. And then just, you know, individuals are also going to struggle to keep up with pace of change. And the example you gave earlier around human germline editing, human gene editing, to put it more simply, is a good example where we've put in a moratorium, not because I think people necessarily think, I mean, I'm sure people have different views, but a lot of people don't think it's a never question, yeah. but it was a, we don't want this to just take a runaway, you know, commercial right. incentives and nothing else. We wanted the time to both improve the technology and understand the technology and use it in the most ethical and positive way possible. Yeah. And especially, you know, human general editing, it, it's an irreversible change once, right. once you make it. Right. So I, I think we should generally be like, you know, pretty cautious about making things that are irreversible changes, but have, have right. big, big downside risks. Which I think quite a few things are somewhat irreversible. You know, once industries get established, once people start taking jobs, once certain jobs are no longer in place, or, you know, we forget how to do things the old way, things are probably more irreversible than we realize in many cases. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of path dependency in how uh, economies develop, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, to speak sort of more to the, the implications and challenges more broadly, I, I tend to break this down into three different categories and you can basically ask, okay, what happens if we succeed at a certain category? Like what other problems emerge? So sort of the first hurdle I think we'd face with AGI is just making sure that the individual AI systems behave in a way that we intended them to do. So this is in some ways a sort of minimal desiderata you might have. But if you, let's say, train a language model and you ask it, you know, some facts about the world, it doesn't lie to you. It doesn't just say the thing that it thinks that you want to hear rather than think that's actually true. If you ask it for a plan for how to do something, it generates that plan to the best of its ability. It doesn't just, you know, sneak in some nefarious thing where, you know, it gets a kickback from some provider you're using. You're just getting like, you know. This is what, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what I would think Paul Cristiano calls intent alignment so it just does the thing that the human intended as opposed to someone yeah it, it, exactly so if, a, the AI, if this is the ai alignment problem that you want the ai system to be trying at least trying to do the thing um, that the, the designer and the user wants it to do and, and this is already uh, you know really funny technical problem um as well as having a bunch of sort of philosophical implications but i just sort of say okay well let's assume we solve that already yeah, difficult problem right, you know just well, one big area of research, so yeah, got it. You know, like what's next? And then I think you can start thinking, oh, well, actually, this isn't enough because now, you know, effectively, you've given every human this, uh, you know, superpower, this cognitive superpower. Right. But, you know, we still have this problem that, well, humans disagree about what to do. Right. And so, you know, it, you know, there's a sort of worst case scenario is you've given everyone a nuclear weapon, basically. Right. Like, that's not actually necessarily good. We don't, the present society, which works. Okay, in a lot of areas, we don't just give people each unlimited power to the limits of technology and hope yep. that goes well. That's not how we do things. Exactly. And so, so this, is, this is a problem that it, it could be sort of very destabilizing to society. There's lots of misuse risk, whether those are from individuals or from you know, nation states, maybe forming some more permanent authoritarian states or the use of AI technology. And then I think there's also this interesting sort of like in the middle, well, let's say alignment sort of 99% solved. Mm. So it mostly does the thing I want, but you know, occasionally it has this sort of negative externality mm. of the world. And, and so this is, in some ways, you could say car manufacturers are mostly aligned. I, was gonna, oh, I would almost say almost any technology today, very few of them are perfect. Absolutely. You know, we deal with some amount of failures in almost any yeah. technology or process that we have in the world today. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's mostly okay because things move slow enough that we're able to respond appropriately. And, right. And we have imposed taxes or yeah. remediations. Of yeah. But yeah, you know, I, I imagine a world where effectively AI is going to do my job better. Like there's no human CEOs any longer because they're just, they're just less effective than AI CEOs. And these AI CEOs like mostly do, a, you know, the thing that they should, they're mostly maximizing shareholder interest and mostly complying mm -hmm. with law, but it's like very opaque what they're doing. And, you know, we, we know have like a bunch of AI powered companies, most of human labor has been replaced. And I think it's pretty likely that in this kind of scenario, even if every individual entity is mostly doing what they should, like mm. manufacturing a product that other people want to buy. We're just going to have so little insight into this process. There's going to be AI companies that are just trading with other AI companies. There's right. no humans involved in any of this. That when there are these kinds of negative externalities like pollution, you know, the analogy of that, but happening at a much faster pace, it's going to be very hard for us to, to go in and, and fix that because with human companies and with human employees, we can sort of ask, okay, like, what was the intent of this sure. player? 
what are our incentives? Like, how does this all actually fit together? And we can begin to get a better understanding of industry. But if a whole industry is actually just too complicated for us to understand, then it's going to be very hard for us to know what should we be taxing? What regulation should we have? So then we either need to be able to kind of make sure this moves slowly enough that we can adapt, or we need to have AI systems that are empowering civil society and governments to be able to effectively manage this as well. So we need to be able this to have is, AI systems that explain what all these AI companies are doing and help so us regulate. This The way you frame this, is, I find incredibly interesting because at least as it's framed here, and I think it is an accurate framing, it's an important framing, it actually looks a lot like the world we live in today, pre-AI in a sense, because we already do have things like companies and technology today that has gotten to a level of complexity that very few people understand. So a good example would be all of the algorithms that are in our lives. You know, we have algorithms recommending things to us, choosing, you know, you know, who gets a loan and all these kinds of things. And they've become, the interaction among them has become so complicated that even the experts have a hard time following along, yep. much less average consumers or policy makers. And I guess we already, I mean, and, and to be clear, like that's not a perfect world. We already are, are challenging some of these norms and questioning yep. whether they're right. But I guess what you're talking about here with AI just becomes another level of speed, complexity, fewer human, you know, humans in the loop. And that's where we, we see some real risks. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So I, I don't think that this world is necessarily drastic, you know, kind of qualitatively different from mm. the world we live in today. It is more just this quantitative question of how fast are things moving, how opaque are they? And I think that, you know, a lot of the challenges we're facing today from difficulties with international coordination, difficulties effectively aligning some industries and centers with those of broader society, we're, we're going to continue to see if we're just going to be exacerbated if there's a lot more AI power technology. Now, you know, but that also, I think there's analogy goes in the other direction of, well, we shouldn't throw the baby out with a bathwater. Mm -hmm. Yes, capitalism has some problems, but it's also produced just, you know, almost everything that is, you know, valuable to me in my current life is as a result of capitalism, you know, even things like vaccine production. Yes, there was and a bit of food and the clothes and yeah, it, all, all right. the things we rely on. Yeah. So it, it's, I still, I think that if we manage this well, and it doesn't need to be managed perfectly, if we manage it just reasonably well, uh, this could still be very beneficial for society, but we, we need to be aware of our risks and ideally we'd be able to control the speed at which we're moving. Control the speed, in, in, have those adjustment periods, make the necessary adjustments, keep uh, humans and other parts of civil society, I mean, humans and the organizations that we rely on robust to, to these changes. Yeah, ex exactly. And the speed could still be because they're very fast, potentially. Like, it right. still mean that, you know, the world radically changes in your lifespan uh, or even a period of a decade, but we just need to be able to have some control uh, and be able to say, oh, actually, it, you know, this has moved a little bit too fast. We, we no longer feel like we can effectively manage this. Okay, let's like, you know, pause the things down for a bit. And right now, you know, no one has a pause button, right? It, it's, there's just a lot of uh, incentives to move fast. And to justify your actions for moving fast. There's also a lot of motivated cognition. What are your thoughts, just on a last point on this section, what are your thoughts on OpenAI has made a very, a claim that some people agree with, some people don't, which is that it's important for us to iteratively put out these AI systems into the world to allow society to kind of respond rather than, for example, alternatively, you know, develop or hold off on developing things while like the rest of technology world continues to develop things like hardware, computational hardware, and then only release, you know, very carefully, maybe years or decades later. What did you have any thoughts on that setup and, and how that fits into this future understanding of the world? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, conditional on companies or teams having done development, I'd, I'd want there to be some release of that in, into the world. It mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily need to be released as a product. It could be, just be released as, you know, here are the, um, you know, some benchmark results. Here are how significant we think it is. I think we do need to start carefully thinking about whether it, it's safe to release some of these systems. Like there's already significant misuse risks from some of the language models. Like they, they can help you build a bot, for example. And they sort of done safety fine tuning to make it refuse to say that. But there's, there's plenty of ways to, to get around these, sure. these safety filters. And, and right now, you know, I don't think it's helpful enough that the kind of person who knows how to use these language models, they, they could figure this out on their own right. But I do think it's 
quite possible that you know within a, a generation or two of these language models it's going to actually be a, a pretty helpful way if you're just a smart generalist but don't have a specialized you know chemistry degree or something like that then working with these models is going to like help you know help you be able yeah. to do things it already goes a long way so, so, so i do think that they need to like you know some real questions about the deployment and not just say yeah we should put everything out there in, in the world but i think my bigger critique of open ai is not that they've you know released things that they've built but it's that was it actually a good thing to be putting so much uh, time and energy into building this thing when they knew that they wasn't really a way of being able to make it safe so it, i would really much prefer to live in a world where there's a norm of you know if you build a bridge you don't say i built the biggest bridge but it might fall down at any point so that's not an impressive engineering accomplishment like part of a discipline of bridge mm -hmm. engineering is you build stuff that stands up and is safe right i think there should be a similar thing of oh it's really impressive you built a very capable and a safe ai system but if you just built a system that's capable that has a bunch of you know negative stereotypes it's racist it sometimes produces toxic output it often like makes up facts about the world it hallucinates um and it can be uh, that's my Siri in the background. Um, um, so the, the AIs are not perfect. If you can. Yeah, the AIs are definitely not perfect. But yeah, you know, when it has all of these like known safety problems, then I think people should be, you know, really reconsidering whether the more resources should be going into fixing those safety problems rather than just making the models bigger. Yeah. And so that, that'd be my fundamental concern. Do you think, I feel like one response they might have to that is it's going to be very hard for us to make things safe without also like playing, you know, doing things like trying things, capabilities. So for example, you know, maybe if we push that analogy, you know, it's hard to secure a bridge that you've never, if you've never even seen a bridge, if, you, if the concept of a bridge is non-existent. So is there some push and pull here between the capabilities and the safety side? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that there's, there's benefit to having sort of a bigger particle accelerator, as it were. Like if at some point, if you want to do, you know, progress in physics you just need a bigger machine to smash things together and i think there's something similar where if we're trying to eventually make very capable ai systems safe it's helpful if we have more capable ai systems to practice with the reason i guess i don't find that argument compelling by open ai case is that there are plenty of safety problems present in gpt2 that weren't fixed before they built gpt3 there are plenty of problems in gpt3 before they built gpt4 so it, it, it seems like in many cases they, they could have made a lot of progress fixing this on a small scale model and if it was something where, you know, half of their resources were going into safety and half of them were going to building bigger models, I might say, well, okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it really is more useful, quite useful to have these bigger models. But I, I think, you know, right now the, the split's probably more like 90% is building bigger models, 10% is going that's, to make I think that safe. sounds right to me. From um, and, and, you know, they, they did make a commitment recently to allocate 20% of their current compute spend to safety, which is a, a big improvement, but it's sort of like 20% is A, you know, it's still a minority. B, this is a, a new thing, they're increasing it. And, you know, see that only say relative to our current compute spend, but we're actually probably planning on at least doubling and maybe, you know, increasing by more like an order of magnitude for computational resources for use overall. So this 20% commitment might end up being more like a 2%. Yeah, I don't remember the exact wording of their announcement, if it's like current or future, but regardless, even the best case, best reading of that, it's 20%. So that's yeah. the best possible reading. Yeah. So that's us. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, I hear you. And I think this is... This goes back to your point about what's the level of robustness, you know, like the how many nines of reliability do we want and what, and people will not agree on that, right? Oh, people yeah. will say, well, the benefits outweigh the negatives. And then you add in commercial incentives or even, I would even say commercial needs because these organizations need them to sort of stay yeah. alive. Those, kind, those incentives and decision-making becomes quite, quite well-colored by those incentives. Yeah, I mean, you know, ultimately... AI companies like OpenAI and also Anthropic, they're pursuing this scaling agenda that requires increasing levels of investment. Like it's not even just that they have a fixed burn rate, it's increasing substantially every year as they you know, primarily compute spend, but also hire more engineers. So although OpenAI has actually got a fair amount of revenue, now it's still just like drastically less than the amount of investment that they, they intend to make. So if you're pursuing that strategy, there is a sort of huge commercial pressure to say, well, actually just in order to stay alive, you need to be having like bigger and better and more impressive products coming out on a fairly regular basis. So I, I can absolutely see how, you know, in that environment, it's very easy to sort of convince yourself with you know, some degree of justification that, okay, you, you need to be keep, keeping moving, kind of, you know, we're the good guys, it's better if we build this than someone that doesn't care about safety at all. So yeah, sure, let's cut a few corners. And, you know, I don't, 
agree with this, but it is not a completely crazy perspective to have. But I think from a sort of humanity wide perspective, it's very crazy that we're doing this from an individual company perspective. That's how the incentives are shaped. But you know, I think this is a good example where it is a, you know, they're not bearing all the downside to the technology sure, going awry. Sure. I mean, so there is this big negative. I mean, I think we not, all might hey, bear the downsides, but yeah. <laughs> including well, them. But I hear what you're saying there. Yeah, you know, their calculus is different to humanity's calculus. Right, right. If you've got a you know one percent chance that everyone dies and a nine nine percent chance that you become a trillion dollar yeah. company, I know like plenty of startup founders who'd be like, well, these are amazing point. odds. You know, I, I, normally you're assuming there's a one or two percent chance your company makes it big. I wish I could tell you were yeah. wrong, but I really can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I don't think there's anyone that's actually, you know, literally reasoning through that, but sure. entrepreneurship is selecting for people who are just very willing to take risks because otherwise you would not be in that kind of industry. And so when you tell someone, well, there's this, you know, fairly, you know, small, but significant probability that there's a really big downside to your technology, they just don't have a personality which is receptive to that. And then add on top of that, this sort of techno religion that's dominant in Silicon Valley. <laughs> uh, and, and that techno determinism, yeah. I think you right. mentioned earlier too, of this idea that someone's going to build it anyway, may as well be me right. type reasoning. And I, that's, you know, I'm, I, that's a simpler simplification of the logic, but it, it comes up. Yeah, it, it absolutely comes up. And then I, I think there's also a it, probably relatively small, but quite influential subset of people that just want to be immortal. And I'm like, worried they're going to die. Sure. So they're like, I, I can't, we don't want to go too slow because if we don't build age right before, you know, the end of my natural lifespan, but I'm, but I'm just going to die. Well, that's like incredibly all the selfish. in, you know, yeah, previous yeah. generations. Right. So we've got to get there first. And, you know, fortunately, I think most of the AI founders are young enough that this doesn't play like too much of a <laughs> God, that's influence. All relying on. But, you know, I think it is, it is influencing some people's decisions. That's a, I actually hadn't specifically heard it said that way. And I hope you're wrong, but I know you're at least a little bit right. I mean, somebody, that thought has come across their mind. All right, well, We'll move on because there's yep. so much we can dig into around this. But uh, yeah, you know. But look, overall, I agree with you that these mixed incentives and, and structures are not necessarily all pointing us towards the best possible future, which is why we need to change some of those. Adam, I'd love to hear a little bit more about Far's work in this field and your own work in this field. So, what is Far focused on at the moment, and how do you think it might be part of this, you know, better future? How do you think it's contributing? Yeah, absolutely. Far is working on three main research agendas right now. First one is science of robustness. So the idea is trying to be able to rigorously predict when a given AI system is going to break down in a certain situation. So kind of going back to the bridge analogy, this would be sort of stress testing for bridges and be able to say, okay, it can bear like this many vehicles weight, but not more than that. And but that's obviously really important for AI safety to be able to actually analyze the design and say, is it safe enough for a given purpose? or not, whereas right now it's much more sort of empirical trial and error, just shooting in the dark and seeing if, if things break. And then a complementary approach we're pursuing is a science of interpretability. So interpretability meaning understanding the inner workings of an AI system has been a really, sort of, this is a really huge, rapidly growing research field for interpretability, but right now I'd say there's not a clear kind of scientific criteria for whether a given interpretability method is actually making progress or not, is it a faithful representation of what's going on in a model? And mm. so it's more of an engineering discipline right now than a mm. scientific discipline. And we think in order to actually be able to continue to make progress in this field and have work that can build on top of each other, we need to start introducing more things like benchmarks and clear evaluation criteria. So you can actually say, oh, this method for interpretability is better than this other method. And then you can start improving on it rather than it just being this collection of you know interesting tools, but without you know much clarity on, on where it's going to go from back. Yeah, and I, I've definitely seen some of that myself, the, the questions around the rigor of what's happening, where it's, you've measured something, but was it, you know, was it because you already had, could have, you know, you already knew your outputs, you knew exactly. Yeah. How much true predictable, excuse me, how much predictive power does this interpretability technique provide? Things like that are still a lot of questions. And you're right about building on top. It does seem like a lot of things sitting next to each other instead of building on top of each other. Exactly. Like right now, there's a lot of really fascinating papers we can read over this particular circuit in this neural network. It does this particular task by you know, copying text or something like that. But then you just ask, okay, like how does this fit into a bigger picture? Does this actually let me predict how models behave better not really and so there's sort of a hope i think a lot of practitioners have at some point this is all going to come together into here and unified theory 
And I think that's plausible, but I think we're beginning you know, some steps in the middle, including making it a little bit more of a mature field. And then the third area that we're looking at is a black box evaluation of AI systems. So interpretability is white box, you're, you're looking inside it. But there's also a, a lot of questions you can ask uh, just by looking at the behavior of a system. And so this is one is a bit more applied and we, we sometimes work with the AI companies to evaluate their models prior to release. So this is an area where we're actually able to you know, directly influence the things that are coming out of the world and catch safety problems early before um, they, they you know, actually start causing harm. But we, we've also done things that are a little bit more abstract and just trying to understand overall trends in models. So for example, worked on the inverse scaling prize, which was this crowdsource competition to find areas Started where- by Ethan Perez. The, yeah, this was, yeah, Ethan Perez and Ian McKenzie. And yeah, that, that was looking at tasks where as models get bigger, the performance actually gets worse. So, you know, usually as you just scale up the amount of compute and training data, model performance gets better across the board. And there are some areas where they actually start performing worse. So they do things like pick up on spurious correlations in the, the training data. And so you can easily imagine this is a safety problem where you've got potentially increasingly capable models that can do you know, bigger and bigger actions in the world, but there's just like, you know, some blind spot they have. Yeah. So that, that was another example of our evaluation work. So yeah, generally, I'm definitely interested in doing more things in that direction. I would say evaluation is getting a, to be a sort of relatively crowded space. Mm. Uh, so we're probably differentially putting more work on the, the first two more scientific uh, aspects, but we do think that we often have a comparative advantage to work on evaluation when it closely connects to our existing research agenda. So especially focusing on evaluation for robustness now as well. Yeah. Evaluation is, and I know this because I'm working on this area myself, it is such a, it, it's a loaded, there's a so much wrapped up in that word, yeah. right? I mean, you can't do much anything in machine learning without doing some sort of evaluation of something. Yeah. So one, it's in, involved in almost all research and it's a big field. It covers a lot of ground that, that, you know, inverse scaling looks very different from looking for a specific capability or yep. yeah, there's a lot of different things in there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, it, it's a huge field and I think that we, we need to, so as a collective ecosystem, figure out so, so better division of labor and better categories mm. of evaluation. Like I, I see the being space for a kind of consumer reports style organization that's independent, looking at publicly available models and just kind of giving a scorecard to them. I think there's space for more auditing orgs where you know, companies work very closely with an auditor and the auditor has some independence, but also is, you know, the, the client, it, the A company is their client. So they're not you know, as independent as let's say the consumer report style organization. And then there's also needs to be more people just actually pushing forward the state of art in terms of the techniques used for evaluation. And I think right now we've got a bunch of people trying to do a little bit of all of these. And that's, you know, natural in a fairly early stage field, but over time we need a bit more specialism. Yes, absolutely. And hopefully enough stuff happening in the open where people can also build on each other's work, yeah. ideally. The one I'd love to dig a bit more into, because it's the one I've heard the least about generally field, is the science of robust. Mm -hmm. From what I understand or intuitively understand and have seen some things on a very hard thing to do. You know, the, like you said, the field has become incredibly empirical. It's like, we don't know till we do it type thinking, which is of course somewhat true, but ideally that's not the best setup we want to be. So what are some things you're looking into that field? What have been some maybe early promising signs or research directions in that science of robustness? Yeah, I, absolutely. So, you know, you're totally right that the field is very empirical, but, you know, I think there, there are other scientific disciplines like physics is very empirical, but where we're actually able to find in this sort of messy complexity, some fairly rigorous, at least empirical laws. And I've got sort of similar hope with machine learning. So mm -hmm. one example that was actually somewhat inspired by, by physics was scaling laws. So this was people initially started focusing on scaling laws more of a capability, so rather than the safety side. And found that there were these very predictable trends where if you increase the amount of training data and compute by 10x, then you get a predictable improvement in performance in terms of how accurately a model is able to predict the next token. Uh, and so, and you know, it's a bit hard to predict how this translates into something like GRE exam score or something like that, but you do get these like pr very smooth scaling trends. It's at and, least something that we yeah. didn't have before. Yeah, absolutely. And so this has actually been very influential for many of AI companies that are pursuing these kinds of scaling agendas. Because you imagine you, you 
OpenAI or some when you go to Microsoft and say, okay, I want 10 billion. And well, natural question is, okay, what are you going to give me for that 10 billion? Right. You're like, I'm going to train the biggest model ever. Okay. And yeah, what can why? this model do? Like, why is it commercially valuable? And, and if you can say, well, okay, you know, we've got this actual empirical result that, you know, we can argue that it's going to improve performance as much as we saw with, you know, previous 100x improvements in compute, then you're in a much better case to make this sort of an, an investment case. But we don't have anything like that for safety. And so we don't really know if we train a model in a particular way with a certain amount of compute focused on robustness, like adversarial training, how that actually translates into safety relevant properties. And so I think that, you know, the first step here would just be to try and run those experiments and see if there are some similar scaling laws. But, and yeah, even just look at the models we already have. Because I mean, even yeah. the original scaling law, that particular example you gave, that's that was also empirically derived. It was not a uh, absolutely theoretical yeah. framework. It was like let's plot this on a graph. There's a graph here that there's yep. a trend here. Yeah, and so you're are you looking at similar types of things around safety and robustness? Yeah, ab absolutely. So right now we're looking at varying the amount of adversarial training and adversarial training is the technique where you sort of find areas where the model fails and then you just use that as a part of a training data. So you, you train it on its failures to to not make that same mistake again. And so it's sort of failing intuitively, but the more adversarial training is you, the less likely it is to make the kind of mistakes that you're, you're finding and feeding back into training data. So, so how does that tra translate into how robust a system is as measured by things like how much compute an attacker would need to find a vulnerability in that model? Right. So that's the thing we're looking at right now in some, you know, relatively small scale environments and initial results are, pr are pretty you know, promising, but certainly scaling trends. We don't yet have enough data points to know if it's going to be a sort of rigorous scaling law that holds across different tasks and different model families. But there's at least, you know, some degree of empirical prediction you can make here. So, so that, that's, I think, the direction that we're most excited by. Fantastic. Yeah, so that's quite different to what I've heard from a lot of um, researchers. So that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. I, I think you can also just look at more qualitative considerations and just say, you know, are we going to be able to reach an adequate level of robustness as certain capability in a system? So we, we had a project uh, that came out last year showing that superhuman go systems are still very- I saw that. That attack. was a very interesting. Yeah. And I'll definitely chuck it in the show notes, but yeah. go on and explain. I, I, I really found that fascinating, that paper. Yeah. Thanks. Do you, um, do you want to tell our audience a little bit about what it is? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. So it's the idea is that there are these systems like AlphaGo, which famously beat Lisa Dahl, one of the leading go players of the world and they're widely being considered just much stronger than humans at go like top professionals regularly play against these programs and, and lose and in fact use them as part of their training uh program to you know get better at playing go to, to learn from these programs so it was widely you know imagined that you just you, know, you can't beat these systems they don't have any major blind spots and what we found was that by training another AI system to find an attack against these systems to find a way of beating it, we're actually able to find a very simple strategy that a human can learn in about half an hour. There's YouTube videos now that teach you how to perform a strategy that uh, is able to reliably be not just the AI system that we were training against, but basically every state of art Go AI system. They all have this common vulnerability where they really misevaluate certain board positions. And so I think this is sort of a really powerful lesson that you can have AI systems that are assumed to be very robust and superhuman for real, you know, six or seven years. These systems have been out there. It's a and, long time for yeah. no one to catch these things. And it just shows exactly, how little yeah. people are looking. Or I mean, I, I don't think this was a, to correct me if I'm wrong, but it wasn't an impossibly hard discovery. Just maybe enough people weren't looking. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it was, uh, it, it took a little bit of work, but it, you know, it, it would have been maybe a bit beyond the abilities of most academic labs just because of the compute requirements, but it wasn't something that took a stroke of genius by any means. In fact, our method is almost embarrassingly simple. It was just like the first thing we thought of trying and it, it works. So if we didn't try anything harder, right? so it, it's, people could have done it if they'd been incentivized to, to scrutinize it, but you know, no one really was. And in the case of Go, I mean, okay, so, so what, it's not like it's a safety critical environment, but. I don't think that people are scrutinizing models that are being used for facial recognition or, you know, deciding whether or not to give someone a mortgage right. or it's even fairly limited scrutiny of these sort of large language models are now powering, you know, lots of different startups applications. Absolutely. So I think there's definitely going to be similarly a severe issues about something through the cracks. Right. This whole area of adversarial robustness is a research field, but there's just so much more still to do, particularly with 
cutting edge models where yeah. they've been released with you know not a lot of eyes on them not a lot of yep. models people can play with in the research field it is a real, real concern yep yeah absolutely and i think this is the, the key takeaway for this work from a science of robustness angle is being superhuman is not enough to be robust because you might have hoped so oh, you know when you reach human levels of capabilities in a common case you're also going to have human like cognitive reasoning but actually you know these systems are you know, thinking in a very alien they're flaw- way. They're fallible. They are exactly, perfect. exactly. And that's where the challenges just come up. And I just want to make a little side note here, and I think it's important for our listeners. I, you know, while this stuff is not trivial to do, I also don't think it's rocket science either. It's not, you know, so I've, I'm working on a research paper myself and I'm fairly new to the world of machine learning, certainly completely new to the world of machine learning and research. And I've been surprised at the low-hanging fruit that exists when it comes to research, yeah. to, to making things, you know, teaching us things that are safety relevant. So if you're out there and you're thinking, oh, well, I haven't done a PhD or 10 years of this, or I, it, it's, if you've got technical skills, if you've got the motivation, you want to do something, it, this is not out of reach for yeah I, I absolutely especially things like finding vulnerabilities in models or some kinds of interpretability research has just a lot of low-hanging fruit there because there's so many different models and you know such situ- threat models or situations where they might fail that just haven't been considered yet and i think there's sort of there's almost a superpower you have if you are coming from outside of the existing ml research field you see things with a fresh pair of eyes and you have a different set of incentives so for, i think there are some you know, things that would make really good blog posts that just probably would be very hard to publish as an academic paper because mm. people would look at it and be like, well, there's no novelty here. Use the same method. We know that other things like this are vulnerable, but where it's not necessarily like common knowledge, fed up certain category totally. system is vulnerable. Like the more applied it is, the more you're looking at like models that are actually deployed out over the world and seeing how robust we are, like the less interesting it is to a lot of academia. So there's a lot of things that, that you can, you know, really play to unique strengths there. I, I do also think, you know, if people are interested in pursuing this, it, it is helpful if they can get some degree of feedback and guidance from an experienced Absolutely. researcher. There are some things that are very easy to do if you're new, and also some things that are like surprisingly difficult, but you definitely don't need to, you know, finish a PhD before you can do useful research, not at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're right. And there are, you know, it's not like you need to be out there on your own. And I personally recently did the ARENA program in London. It was a six week program learning ML fundamentals for safety. And that's actually what led to the research capstone, which has led to this research paper. And that's just one of, you know, a good maybe half dozen or more programs, at least actually probably a dozen programs around the world where you can learn the skills and sit alongside or virtually sit alongside people around the world who care about this. So I'll put some of those in the show links. And in general, this is, there are on ramps onto, onto the AI safety field. Great. Fantastic. There's so many things I want to ask you about, Adam. I'll I'll have to pick and choose very carefully here. Let's touch on this question because I do think it is important. What do you think we should be doing in the world in responses to this these kind of challenges around AGI and advanced AI that we're not doing today? What are some of the gaps that you see in the ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think one of the biggest gaps is just creating new research directions that really have a, a you know, strong chance of solving some of the core technical problems of safety. So I think we're in a slightly weird situation right now where the amount of interest and attention going to safety has rapidly exploded, but the number of people that are actually working on technical safety research is still growing a lot slower. Mm. And then within that, I've seen a lot of almost like consolidation behind a few research directions that are promising but if you ask even the people working on those directions oh is this going to solve a safety problem there's lots of problems this is just a piece this is just you know the the minimum thing that we should start with and so i've been a you know a bit surprised if there's not more people saying well okay you know what's the the next big thing how can we solve more ambitious problems and you know of course it's a bit hard to say oh well you know the gap we need to fill you just need more like genius ideas but i think it needs you don't need to be a, a genius to work on this you just need to be able to see with a clear set of eyes what the problems are you need to gather um you know some relevant research experience and i think in some ways what we're, we're missing are people that are just willing to do a psychologically hard work of oh this is a open problem and we don't know quite what to do let's explore it and then are able to lead a team around that but it's not enough if just one person has a good idea why do you think this hasn't happened yet? You know, what is it? Who? What are some kind of example ways people might fall into this? What's stopping this happening now? To the well, it's happening, but yeah. uh, you know, at the rate that we wanted to. These new research directions. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it is it is a hard thing to do. It, it's saying, oh, you know, it'd just be great if we had more like commercially successful startups. Well, sure, but you know, it's a hard thing to do. Sure. A lot of people don't want to do it. A lot of people can't do it. But I think that we could be doing a lot more than we are because when I look at this community, I don't think, oh, you know, these people just aren't talented enough. I'm often just blown away by how talented some people going into mm. this field are. And I think a big part of it is incentives. Uh, so if you go work one of these AI companies, there's a lot more pressure to sort of work on the thing that people are already pursuing in terms of safety agenda. There's often like oh. a pretty strong filter on what kind of worldview you're even like allowed to have within that kind of company. Right. And also, we also just talked to earlier about, you know, maybe there's a nine to one ratio of right. people going straight into the capability. They're not even working on safety once they join these companies. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. And I think there's, there's a bunch of people who join various companies and work on things that are somewhere in between safety and capabilities. Right. And obviously there's an incentive for these companies to, to push people more in the capabilities direction sometimes. So I think that that's a big problem. And then, you know, on the academic side, there's more scope to explore new things. But as soon as you become a professor, you're just overloaded with teaching, admin, mentorship. So you actually have very little time to develop your own research agenda. Mm. So I think we have sort of set things up in a way that the People that are more experienced researchers who would be best placed to work on this often like very rapidly get put in an environment that's not actually very conducive to them. Just and I think we idea. should on that point around ac academia, ac academia, we should also call out it's not there's not you know compared to other fields it's not like there's just dozens dozens of academic labs in the world oh, no. working on this. Yeah, yeah. There's you know I can name most of them and that's not great. <laughs> I mean yeah. that means yeah. there's too few of them and I can you know remember too many. So. It's also just probably sheer numbers on of some of these more experienced research. Well, yeah, I think, I think that's definitely a big part of it. And um, AI as a whole has been a very rapidly growing field and I think has a sort of skewed senior to junior ratio. So it's pretty common at right. Berkeley. There's, there's a lot more junior. There's a lot more junior people, yeah. So it's very sort of bottom heavy. And at, at Berkeley, which is one of the top places to do AI research, it was very common for professors to have 15 to 20 PhD students. Mm. And I sort of talking to other people in the computer science departments, like the same department. And if you're in somewhere like CS Fury, they might have five PhD students. Right. So um, those, yeah, so, you can see those ratios. Yeah. There. Yeah. So you just get a lot less mentorship and the process have a lot less time to actually do individual contributor research. And so I think that's, that works out fine when it's fairly clear what you need to do. And then you can just direct a bunch of students to work in those areas. And it works a lot less well when you're still trying to figure out in some cases what the most important problems are and how to formalize them. So what do you think? Because obviously most people listening here are probably not going to be at the level where they can jump in on a research direction. Yeah. But let's even say maybe one in a thousand people listening could. What are some, or, or maybe there's some other things they can be doing. What are some like, do you, do you, are there any suggestions, concrete suggestions you have for either our people who are on the junior end, or people who are on more experienced and somewhere in the world of ML and technical fields, what would you suggest? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, certainly if we're on the more senior end, then, you know, try and become a person that can come up with great ideas and lead research teams. Or if you've it. got one, yeah. or if jump got on one, it. Yeah. We're, we're, it, we're here yeah, to tell you, please do it. Yeah, don't, don't just, you know, let, you know, for incentives or money lure yeah, you Yeah, don't think it's that. done. The job's yeah. not done. Yeah. On the more junior side, I actually think there's a lot that, that people can do there as well. So on the junior researcher side, I think sometimes just joining a lab where it's academic or elsewhere where it's got someone senior who is sort of sympathetic to safety, but not necessarily actively working on it. That can be a really powerful move both to develop yourself as a researcher, mm. but also to kind of help mentor the you know, person that's normally mentoring you, because right. you're probably going to have a lot more context on the problem and what other people are working on than they do. So I, I've really seen actually, like, you know, some of the, except for very few academic labs working on it, it's true, uh, but some of those have come about by basically someone joining and doing a PhD and convincing their professor, oh, actually this is a problem. Right. problem. So you can be yeah. the one to drive, like help, you know, get your professor to actually care about these problems and give you the mentorship you need to be successful while also getting somebody else more senior involved in the field. And, and then, yeah, I don't definitely don't want this to sound like, oh, you know, you have to be a researcher to contribute to this. I think there's actually, we're really bottlenecked on people that can start or help scale functional organizations. Because I, you know, I think there's a sort of flip, flip side to, to AI being relatively young as a research field, like young as an age. I, I think AI safety is even more extreme in that area. And so we just have a sort of dearth of people that are experienced leaders. Like I count as one of the old people, but, you know, I'm, I'm like, 
for, I, mean, I just turned 30 this year. So, you know, <laughs> definitely not in any other area I'd be considered right, an early right. career right. researcher. So he can bring... Yeah, you know, there's no way far would be where we are today without our chief operations officer as well as like a number of like key people on the operations team. We also just hired someone on the software engineering side that has a wealth of experience from working in various industry positions. And so filling that kind of tech lead role is also really valuable a lot of organizations. So I think there's a lot that, that can be done. And as I was saying earlier, there's just a lot of organizations that I'd love to see exist that don't currently. So the consumer report style scorecard organization, no one's done that yet. I think there's a few people considering it, but like right now it's still wide open. Another example that I think it just probably should exist would be almost like a agency for public intellectuals that mm. are interested in this problem. So we've got some like very overloaded professors or of academics who are interested in AI safety, but you know, they don't have anyone to manage their media schedule or anything like that. So there's just mm-hmm. like a bunch of opportunities that are probably falling through the cracks. So that'd be like another example of course, you know, completely different skill set. Other things that I'd be excited by would be solving some sort of infrastructure problems that people face. So compute is a big one. Because like a lot of academic labs just don't have enough computes. And, so, and I know FAR yeah. made some efforts in this area too, right? Like FAR was trying to provide more of that engineering compute support to labs. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that, that's right. I mean, we ended up deprioritizing a lot of that. You know, we could, we could drive more value there. But I think that speaks more to our comparative advantage in terms of, you know, me being a researcher and a lot of people we hired having that kind of research interest. Whereas if someone was coming more from, let's say, a background of running a software engineering consultancy, but it'd be like very natural for him to be like, oh, let's do the same, but for, you know, labs or safety researchers more generally. We might still work on some of this. So we are talking to a few places about providing compute support, for example. It's one of those things where it's quite effortful to do at a small scale. And it's much better if that's just a thing that you're focusing on and you have a ton of customers because most of the costs here are fixed. So it's one of those things where I don't want to say, go big or go home. You don't just want to have a handful of customers. That's and not what are your thing. thoughts? Because there is the, I think Case has a compute cluster for this sort of thing. Are those things not quite filling the niche? Yeah, I mean, you know, I can't speak to Case's future plans, but my impression of the, the current state of it is that people have had positive impressions working with it, but also it's not something that they can stably rely upon because you basically apply to get compute for a particular project mm. and then you get allocated it for some period of time. Right. But Maybe then, the you know, if you just have someone join your lab and they want to do work on a new project, you don't necessarily have compute for it in that, that sense. So it definitely still feels a lot worse than working at one of the AI companies where just sure. everyone has this sort of no questions asked allocation of at least a reasonable amount of compute. Of course, if you want to really scale up and train a you know, million dollar training run, then maybe you need to actually ask for permission. But I think getting closer to that for just every major AI safety researcher would be awesome. And uh, maybe Case is planning on doing that, but it, as far as I know, they don't have. So we've had a good chance to talk about, you know, on ramps onto research. We've started about engineering and other job needs. And we'll I'll put on things like job boards and job links into the, to the show links for people to explore as well. One area we haven't touched on that I'm curious about is funding and money for these organizations. In your experience, is funding a, a challenge for all these people trying to work on this, including maybe new people trying to start new organizations? And to the extent that it is, how can people help or what, what are some of the solutions? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so funding is only a, a limitation and it, it's felt especially acute in the, the last year uh, because some major donors in the space have either you know cut back or kind of shifted their priorities it's just generally been a, a bit of a chaotic time to be around although the flip side is that there's also a bunch of new donors beginning to get interested in, in, in this area so I think overall I still feel very optimistic about the funding landscape but maybe especially in the next year or two is a very kind of influential time where donations can mean a lot more than they would in the long run because yep. there's a lot of organizations that are just getting off the ground that need seed funding or there's more mature organizations like us that, that need sort of bridge funding and then there'll be much bigger maybe institutional donors coming online in a year or two that can help scale those organizations e- even further. So, I, you know, I, I would say that if you were considering either just like actually directly doing work or donating if, if you do have a skill set that really lends itself to doing direct work in this area i'd still like strongly encourage you to do, do the work rather than donation because i do think we're still more bottlenecked on you know new organizations that have really exciting missions and teams than we are by funding like i don't think i'm seeing really promising organizations that aren't getting any funding at all but i am seeing 
organizations that I consider to be pretty promising who are growing slower than they would like or are making slightly bad time money trade-offs because they didn't have enough funding. Right. I remember there's a lot of organizations or people that are, you know, promising and probably worth giving a chance. If they were in a for-profit space, a VC wouldn't take a punt on them, but which are just a bit higher risk that aren't maybe not actually getting the funding. You know, some concrete organizations that I think would benefit from more funding. I know that Arc Evals is spinning out and they, they've previously been doing a lot of evaluation auditing work with labs. They're spinning out into a new organization. I think the name is still uh, to be decided, but I know that they're, they're ramping up a fundraising rounds there. Okay. And, you know, they've been doing some really good work on oh, fantastic. Um, they evaluation Some models. of the evaluators on GPT-4 and the Claude 2, and they really did yeah. bring up some really important points in some of those. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think they're one of a few evaluations organizations that's really focused on problems that are particularly relevant for very advanced AI systems. So right. they're trying to think ahead and not just look at, you know, the problems that are going to emerge with current AI systems. So I think that's one exciting organization on the more academic lab side, a sense of human compatible AI, which I, I did my PhD in, but no longer affiliated with. I think that they are doing some good work both on field building side, they, they run an annual workshop, as well as just supporting a lot of you know, good junior talent and PhD students. I've seen, you know, a lot of good people come out of there as well as I'm doing some interesting research. So I definitely support donations uh, and, you know, I also plug our, ourselves. We do have a significant funding gap right now. So our ambitious scaling plan uh, ha would require around $3 million more in funding uh, for the next, fund us for the next 18 months. We are looking likely to fill our sort of non-ambitious funding plan that's just adding one or two staff growing pretty slowly but i think that this is such a fast moving field that i would be reluctant to just kind of sit on the sidelines and grow really slowly Absolutely. when there's a lot of areas where we could be adding value Absolutely. so you know we definitely value support and i'd also say strategically donors should be thinking a bit about their size of their donations because some organizations would actually really benefit from lots of small donors just so they can say we've got this broad basin of support I think ARC falls in that category, actually, where it's like great for their independence if they have just lots of people supporting their work. Whereas the other organizations, that, that that's not an advantage and they just would like to have, you know, a few really chunky donations from institutional funders. And I would just say, you know, obviously a lot of this is going to be just defined by the donor's limitations. For sure. So, yeah. you know, I do think this is one of those things where every dollar counts and having spoken not just to Adam, but to many other not for profit leaders in the space. You know, I think while there is funding in the field, it is more limited, you know, often provided quite late, you know, quite you know, with short timelines as far as like the ability to plan ahead. And, you know, and as Adam mentioned, people are picking less ambitious, you know, plans. You know, they're hiring, to be honest, you know, lower salaries, which makes it very hard to compete with these kind of larger orgs or these commercial orgs, you know, so every dollar does count and yep. um and, and if even if adam wasn't plugging far today i would be um because i've seen great work come out of them and i'm here in their office here in berkeley and it's just incredible to say okay i want to work on ai safety be able to show up here no questions asked get started and, and do really high quality work so far alongside chai alongside arc like these are all organizations that you can help out um, if you're listening to this and care about the challenges we're talking about absolutely so I think that's a pretty good place to pause, not least because I just looked at I, my uh, laptop's not plugged into a charger, which is always dangerous. <laughs> uh, thankfully, it's doing okay for the moment. But Adam, did you have any last comments for our listeners before we wrapped up today? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that my parting thought would be that this is a really rapidly evolving field and uh, we, we definitely need people with a wide range of backgrounds uh, to be working on it. But I also think that because it's growing so fast, even if you're listening to us and think, well, I don't really know where I start in right now, there's a d very high chance that in the next two, two to three years, roles will open up that actually are a perfect fit for you. So I think even if you'd ask people a couple of years ago, Something like, oh, do we need, you know, lobbyists, for example, people are like, oh, no, we don't have any idea what kind of regulation we want. No one's interested in it yet. And now suddenly everyone's scrambling being like, oh, actually, this is a great policy window to be operating in. And so I think if, if anything, people probably should have been investing in this earlier. But this is a sort of one example where a skill that was not at all in demand a few years ago is now like massively in demand, just people who communicate clearly with policymakers. I think we're going to see a lot more things like that. Like maybe right now your skill is in being able to 
really effectively run and manage a large organization. And I think it's already like valuable, but to be clear, I think that it's going to get much more valuable in a few years when some of these organizations are bigger and more mature. So I just sort of say stay engaged in the space and keep an eye on opportunities and things are like very likely to come up in the near future. Fantastic. Completely agree. Yes, this is there's a lot more to play out here and people can contribute at the points that are best for them. And if they follow along, they can see those opportunities. That'd be fantastic. Yep. And we'll wrap up there. We'll continue the series, talking to the people, responding to these challenges and continue to give our listeners ways to get involved. Just want to say a huge thank you to Adam for sharing so much of your knowledge today and teaching me and, and all of our listeners about a lot of the great things going on in the field and the things we need to, to do better on. So it's a pleasure to be on the show. Cool. Thank you, Adam.